Welcome to Heritage Worship as we gather together here online. And as you probably heard by now, we have in-person Heritage now available if you want to come at nine o'clock on Sundays. And we've also been saying that we're changing the formatting of how our online Heritage will be delivered. So we'll be sharing about that um, before we make the switch. But meanwhile, let's just focus, turn our attention to God in gratitude that God has enabled us to gather this way, that the Holy Spirit is wherever you are and guiding. So let's focus as we join the choir in singing the hymn, Help Us to Accept Each Other. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for accepting us. Um, we, each of us, has come to you just as we are. And, and even if we've tried to put on a good face or, or put on airs or be impressive, we know you see, you see right through all of that. And you receive us as we are, not as we imagine ourselves to be, whether that's better than or less than, and we thank you. And, and we pray again an echo of the song we have just sung, Lord, help us accept each other that, that way, the way you've accepted us. Uh, it is so frightening, Lord, we confess to be ourselves sometimes. It's so frightening to come to you. It's frightening to, to um, be real with each other. Our, our, our tendency is so much to hide and, and we confess that to you and we lay that before you and we pray, Father, that you, would, uh, that you would so fill us with your love that we are aware of your love and the value that you place on us, the, the longing and desire you have for us and, and let your love for us encourage us and comfort us and strengthen us to be open and true and vulnerable with you and with each other, uh, to, to acknowledge our strengths and our weaknesses, to follow as best we're able and, and, and not be ashamed of what we can't do or, or constantly dreaming of what we ought to do, but simply do and be in your presence and with each other. We pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name, we pray together as he taught us. When we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Amen. Well, we've reached that point in the service where we worship God with, with the gifts of tithes and offerings, our, our financial gifts that we offer to the church, to, to God through the church. Um, we've, we've said before, we'll say it again, we're not arm twisting, we're not guilt tripping. We are following a vision and a mission that, that God has given us that, that, that we find so compelling uh, that, you know, connecting diverse people who share a common brokenness with Jesus and igniting a renaissance of reconciliation. And our hope is that you see that vision, um, that you find that mission compelling as well, and that you want to give out of a love for God, out of a love for our neighbors, our sisters and brothers who don't yet know how much God loves them, who, who have not yet been reconciled to God and to people around them who might be living in fear of, of a God that will judge them or a universe that will simply swallow them. And if, if you're burning with that passion and that desire as well, then part of the way we pursue that is with these gifts. They... You know, the money, we use it to pursue that mission. Um, we use it all for that. So if you're able to give, please give generously. Please give hopefully. Please give prayerfully, knowing that, that all that you're giving is, is, is fueling this mission that God has given Garfield Memorial Church. And let's just take a moment and say, God, thank you for all that you have given us. Receive these gifts. Use them. Use them, Lord to help us ignite a renaissance of reconciliation, um, not just in Cleveland, but all over the world, connecting diverse people who share a common brokenness with Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. There are a lot of different ways to give. You can see them on the screen. You can text to give. Garfieldchurch.org is probably the best way to do it. You can go in there, set up a, 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 a repeating electronic transfer thing. I know my technical jargon is stunning, isn't it? Uh, and then you don't have to worry about it. You can, you can set it and, and it, it's there and it happens even if you're traveling, even if you're going out, you know, even if things get distracting and, and, and you forget, then that gift is still coming and the mission is still moving. So however you're giving though, please know once again, it all goes, it all goes to help us connect diverse people who share a common brokenness with Jesus. So let's continue and worship this morning um, as we hear the choir singing praises to God.
We're in our series, A Big Fish Story, and Pastor Chip will uh, share the second message in this series. And it might sound a little familiar. It's from Jonah chapter 1, a slightly different shift in verses than we heard last week. So let's listen now to Jonah 1, verses 4 through 17. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. May God bless our hearing in response to his word. But first, a man who went inside a humpback whale the hard way this weekend. He traveled 3,000 miles and endured numerous nose swabs to be here with us in studio, all the way from Provincetown, Massachusetts. Please welcome Captain Michael Packard and First Mate Josiah Mayo. Gentlemen, thank you for coming here. We really appreciate it. <laughs> what a strange, what a, I guess my first question should be, had you been swallowed by a whale before, or was this your first? <laughs> Thank God, no. No, you had not. This is your first time. We built this for you. Um, I heard you freaked out a little when you saw it. I did. Yeah. And, and I was like, I thought about it, and I was like, no way am I getting in that. <laughs> I'm going back to Cape Cod. <laughs> Well, but then I thought about it harder, and I said, you know what? It's the perfect celebration of life. I, sur <laughs> I survived. You sure I did. Survived. You survived. And this is not the first time. And my two boys, my two boys are home watching this. How old are they? They're 12 and 16. What are their names? Jacob and Josiah. Did they believe you? Oh, did you name Josiah after Josiah? <laughs> yes, I oh, did. How about that? Wow, you guys are tired. All right, so just to set the stage, first of all, this is not your... First near-death experience, you were on a plane crash with fatalities. You um, have been face-to-face -face with great white sharks. You um, discovered a body in the ocean. You've been through a lot of stuff. I have. You might be bad luck, actually, Josiah. You might want to be careful. And then last week, you were swallowed by a whale. I wasn't swallowed, Jimmy. I was in his mouth. Well, Let's get that straight. I got a show to do, and I'm going with swallowed. <laughs> You were in his mouth. Okay, you weren't swallowed. Interesting. All right, I guess there is a difference. Yeah. Because if you were swallowed, you would have come out the other end, huh? All right. So, all right. So you guys are out on the boat. You're, you're fishing for lobster. You're diving for lobster. And you do it like the old-fashioned way. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You dive down there. You grab them with your hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And then, Josiah, you, tell us what you witnessed. Well, we'd uh, done a couple of dives, and uh, we caught a couple hundred, hundred pounds of lobster or something like that. And um, he went down for a, a third dive. Everything was normal, and he kind of drifted away. His bubbles went away from the boat. And uh, then I just saw a huge boil splashing, slashing all over the water. And I thought, oh, man, this is it. This is that shark attack that we're always, you know, worried about. And um, then I saw whale parts. I saw, you know, whale fluke and a, the whale's head. And I suddenly knew it wasn't a shark attack, but still something crazy was happening. Then Michael shot out of the water. I could see his little legs kind of. <laughs> flying out of the water in the just out of a boil an eruption of white water and um and then you come up yeah. and you i mean i guess well first of all what were you experiencing while you were under the water well when it first happened i like like josiah said i was descending i almost got to the bottom i was at about 35 feet and i just got hit by a freight truck just this bang and then it everything just went instantly dark and I'm just moving, traveling fast through the water, and I'm like, what the heck? Did I just get, get eaten by a shark? And I was like, no, shark's mouths aren't that big, and I don't feel any teeth. Oh, great, I didn't get eaten by a shark. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm interested. But but I'm in a whale's mouth. You're in a whale's mouth. What the hell do I do? You knew you were aware while you were in there that you're inside the whale. Absolutely. Well. And when you said you could feel yourself moving through the water quickly, so you could actually, it was almost like being in a submarine or something where you were feeling exactly. that motion. Yeah, a submarine or a car or a, a motorcycle, then, but with water just rushing. Just did you begin to struggle and, uh, and let the whale know that you were in there? I was struggling and banging and kicking and and just thinking there's no way i'm gonna get out of this unless he decides to let me go yeah and i'm dead this wow is how I'm you gonna had go. all of those thoughts how long were you in there i would say approximately 30 to 40 seconds i'm sure you've heard from a lot of people have you heard of this ever happening to anyone before besides just, in the bible just, just since this happened i just saw a cameraman in south africa wow Oh, I'd love for you to meet him. Wouldn't that be fun? You guys should have a club. <laughs> yeah. And so then you call 911. Yeah, well, we got him back on the boat, and we, we, a friend of ours helped me lift him back on the boat, and we just first communicated with him. You know, I pulled the boat up to him and said, you know, what's going on? You're okay? You're okay? He said his leg was broken. He thought his leg was broken. We pulled him on the boat, and then... Um, the first thing I said was, I was in the whale's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So we're continuing week two of our summer teaching series, A Big Fish Story, uh, the story of Jonah, what's known as Jonah and the Whale. Uh, we couldn't resist playing that clip from Jimmy Kimmel, uh, just so you know that the story I told last week was actually true of Michael, the lobster, uh, commercial lobster diver who was actually swallowed, uh, well, not totally swallowed, but at least in the mouth of a humpback whale. I love when Jimmy Kimmel said, did you hear anybody else? Yeah, there's another guy down in South Africa where you guys should start a club. Well, we have the charter member of the club. And as I said last week, we can't get hung up on the whale. In fact, the Hebrew word, I didn't mention this last week, it's not even the Hebrew word for whale. Uh, they had a word for that, for Leviathan, it's in the book of Job. But this was just swallowed by a big fish. Um, now, if we get hung up, on that part of the story, we may not hear the heart of the story. I, I've shared many times, I don't have a problem when the Bible talks about miraculous things. If God created natural law, then God can suspend natural law whenever God wants to. But many times the Bible is speaking to us in images and metaphors. And for us, it's more important, is it a truth story? And what does it mean to be in the belly of a whale? What does it mean to be at the bottom of the sea for three days? with no one to turn to but God. That's what the story of Jonah is about. Um, if you go uh, to a, a, a shoal or listen to a rabbi preach on this story, I did that this past week, expanding my research to listen to what Judaism says about Jonah. They don't call him Jonah, his name is Yonah. 
Um, just like Yahweh was kind of the name of God revealed to uh, Moses at the burning bush. It's not a real name, but it was how God referred to him uh, self-relationally with Moses. Um, Jesus' uh, name in uh, Hebrew is Yeshua with the Y means God saves, Yahweh saves. So why do we then go from Yahweh and Yonah and Yeshua to uh, Jehovah, Jesus, and Jonah? Well, as the Bible, you may not know this, uh, this is very traumatic for some people. The original Bible was not written in English. It was translated through the years. Hebrew of the Hebrew scriptures that we refer to as the Old Testament uh, Koine Greek, everyday Greek language, except for the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. The book of Hebrews is written in more classical Greek. And then the Bible was continually translated. The Old Testament Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. So the whole Bible was in Greek for the Greek speaking world. Then it was translated from there into Latin. And then if you know anything about uh, Martin Luther's kind of rebellion with the, the reformation of the Roman Catholic Church, did not want the Bible simply in the hands of priests in Latin, but in the hands of the people. So thus began the, the, uh, the interpretations into European languages, German or Italian or English. Um, and if you know in German, okay, this is a little trivial piece for you, just a little gem of knowledge. J is always what? The, y, the y sound in German. So by the time it got from German to English, we settled on the J sound. So that's only to help you if you get unsettled sometimes by all these various different names. Uh, but this is the story of Jonah or Yonah. I may flip between the two just to honor our Hebrew roots. And there's another Hebrew word at the very beginning that's interesting. It goes to a point I made last week. And the word is uh, vayehi, vayehi, V-A-Y-E-H-I, if you're spelling in English of a Hebrew word. And it means literally, and it happened. Or it can be interpreted, you've probably heard this in the old King James language, and it came to pass. The Bible uses that sometimes. That's uh, almost like our English folklore of once upon a time. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's the opening to a story. It's narrative. Uh, and it came to pass was uh, Vayahi. I knew now somebody was going to be telling me a narrative. Now, Jonah uh, is the only prophecy, as I shared last week, that you find in narrative form. There's some narratives in Isaiah and Amos, but not the entire prophecy. We said last week, when you listen to the prophets, it's all about the words of the prophets, not the prophet themselves. But in Jonah, the story is totally about the prophet. This is a story of Jonah, of Jonah. And, and we're to identify with him. We're, we're to put ourselves in the story. In fact, the nation of Israel later on, if you read some of their sacred writings, there are references in Hosea and a couple other places where Israel's called Jonah. So they were, the nation was seeing themselves through the story of Jonah. Even though Jonah was a very historical figure, we looked at that last week, referred to in 2 Kings under the reign of Jeroboam II, there was still something about this story for us to look inward and introspect uh, in a different way and relate to how Jonah is relating with God. And I have to tell you, four, four or five weeks I've done research on this. Jonah is a great, it's not just a big fish story, it's a big story for our day and age. Jonah comes, <coughs> the word of God comes to Jonah and tells him to go to Nineveh. Now that was the heart of Israel's enemies, the, the capital of Syria. The Assyrians had laid siege on Jerusalem under King Sennacherib. Sennacherib made Nineveh the head of Assyria. And uh, there was a great fear about that. So uh, we can understand Jonah was being called to go somewhere he didn't want to go. So God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh and Jonah goes actually in the absolute opposite direction toward Tarshish. Jonah is disabandoning his calling, which we shared last week, a prophet, that was their whole identity. So he was committing clear mutiny, going in the opposite direction and leaving the land of Israel, leaving his prophet duties, his covenant relationship with God and going to a different place. Um, we've got uh, five parts of this story if you look at it. I, this is important. I'm gonna lay the root for this. First, uh, you know, if you're watching a play, it'll go from scene to scene to scene. We kind of have that here. The first three verses, the first scene one is in the land of Israel. 
and the characters on stage are the Lord and Jonah. In scene two, we're at sea. This scripture reading today is again in scene two on the sea. And the characters in the story are Jonah and the sailors. They're uh, different religious groups, uh, most likely even different ethnic groups. Um, and Jonah's in the midst of that. The third scene is down in the belly of the big fish. And now it's just the Lord and Jonah again. Scene four is in Nineveh, in the city. God finally gets in there. Now we've got the Lord and Jonah and the Ninevites. And then the last scene, which I'll be preaching at the very end, is outside of Nineveh. And once again, it's just the Lord and Jonah. So though this is a story about Jonah, it's really a story about Jonah and his relationship with God. So you see, God having his private time with Jonah during the calling. Then Jonah goes, flees from God, goes out into rebellion. And then God gets him back in the belly of the whale. It's just Jonah and the Lord again. And then he's out in the city, out in the world, trying to do his thing. And he's miserable. And then the story ends with Jonah and the Lord again. I was interested to find out there are 39 references to God in this story. 39 times it mentions God or the Lord. 65% of those times it uses the sacred word Yahweh, which is a high, high percentage in, in Hebrew scriptures. Yahweh was the relational aspect of God. It was who God said he was to Moses. It's God revealed in relationship to Israel. So when we said last week, Jonah was not just leaving God spatially, he was leaving God relationally, fleeing from the presence of God. We learned last week fleeing from the face of God, right? And even that word flee, every time it's used in the Hebrew, it's leaving a relationship. So Hagar flees Abraham and Sarah. Jacob flees his brother Esau. So, so Jonah, this, this whole story is about how we as a people, how are we doing in our relationship with God and what God seeks for us to do in the world. And when I said God appears 39 times, you may say, well, is that a lot? Yeah, there's 44 verses in Jonah. God appears in 39 out of 44 verses. Now take that to other stories. The story of Ruth, God appears once. The story of Esther, God doesn't appear at all. So this, we call this story Jonah and the whale. Maybe we should call this story the Lord and Jonah. So what's going on here? Why does Jonah break the relationship? Why does Jonah run away? And why do we, why do we break our covenant with God? And when we so doing, break our covenant with others. Because the two go hand in hand. When Jesus said, love God, love others, he wasn't starting some new sentence. It was one sentence. He said, love the Lord your God. That's the primary commandment. And the other is like it, it says in the New Testament, which literally means, and the other is equal, love others. That's why you'll hear John say at one point, how can we claim to love God who we don't see and hate our brothers and sisters who we do see? See, it's, it, it's a breaking down of relationship with God, with others. Jonah flees from God and by so doing, he's down away from the other sailors. He's not out there on deck with them. He's in his own little space. He doesn't want to go around these foreigners and Ninevites. And he's in this broken state. And what is creating it? The key, two things are really creating it. One is fear, right? And the other is hate. And, and hate manifests itself how? In fear. And we're dealing in a day and age where there's a lot of fear and a lot of hate and a lot of anger. So I think Yona has something to teach us about this. God comes specifically to allay our fears. Some people have said that the real antithesis of faith is fear. When the disciples get extremely afraid, whether in a boat, in a storm, whether in situations, walking with Jesus, Jesus will say to them, where is your faith? Now, that seems like he's just chiding them, like, oh, I, why aren't you praying? No, he's saying that if fear is dominating in you, your faith is retreating. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once used a little parable. He said, fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. There was no one there. Faith and fear cannot live together in the same room or in the same heart. And so, of course, the forces of wickedness want us to succumb to fear. Because when we do that, we can't do like Paul, 
fight the good fight, finish the race, keep our faith. And in 365 times, I've shared this many times in the 17 years I've been here at Garfield. 365 times when God appears, it's called a theophany, uh, you know, which means God shows up, an appearance of God, whether through an angel or whatever, God always says the same thing. It says, fear not. Don't be afraid, whether to the shepherds, whether to the disciples, whether to Hagar. Don't be afraid. 365 times. I've always been so struck by that. Whatever calendar we're on, <laughs> the earth rotates 365 times. It's as though God wants to whisper to our inner heart over and over again. Don't be afraid. Now, looking at this passage that we read today in Jonah, if you, if you look at it, it's, it's really a, it's a litany. It's, a, it's a, um, a story form. It's a literary unit all about fear. It starts in fear. It ends in fear, although it's a different kind of fear. And fear shows up in the middle. Did you hear it? It said, you know, all of a sudden this storm came up. And watch, verse 5, then the sailors were afraid and they began to cry out to their own God. And they began to throw cargo overboard. Uh, the captain goes down and wakes up Jonah, right? And says, hey, why aren't you praying? And Jonah fesses up. I serve the Lord of heaven and the sea and, and the, you know, the God of the dry land. And I'm fleeing from God. And it says, then the sailors were very afraid, even more afraid. And finally, at the end of the story, after Jonah says, throw me in. And they do. And the storm calms down. Look how it ends. Then the men feared God even more. In fact, in the original Greek, it says they were exceedingly afraid or terrified. Um, so fear is dominating the story. And I think that this gives us a little parable, some teaching about how do we deal with fear. First, I want you to see this. Fear develops or it comes from storms that we do see and from storms that we don't see. There's an external aspect and an internal aspect, and I want us to see that. First, the external aspect is very obvious. This is a hurricane in the ocean. This is a, a people are fearing for their lives. So the outer storms, right? The outer storms that come at us produce great fear. Some of us saw this terrible tragedy that happened down in Florida in Surfside, just outside Miami Beach. Went 1.30 in the morning. Uh, an apartment complex just crumbles. As we're recording this, they're still digging through uh, the rubble, trying to find unsuspecting lives. I don't know about you, but I look at that on television, I think, my gosh, you know, how awful. You go to bed and next thing you know, your whole apartment complex just out of nowhere crumbles. But see, that's what outer storms do to us. They remind us that ultimately we're finite beings, right? We, we can't control life. We can't handle all aspects of life. We're not adequate to do that. You've heard me say a million times, when we feel like we're losing control, the only thing we're losing is the illusion we ever were in control. Outer storms create fear because they remind us that we're very, very finite beings, okay? Now, inner storms are different. Inner storms, Jonah's dealing with, with an inner issue. That's where his hatred is. He, he does not want to go to the Ninevites. He has been conditioned, conditioned all of his life that they're the wrong people. They're the bad people. Now, there's some good reason for that. If you read the prophet Nahum, it says Nineveh was a very, uh, I mean, it was a city of violence. It was a city of terrorism. So, yeah, that, there's some outward reasons. But when we look at this real story, Jonah doesn't go to Nineveh because he's worried they won't repent and kill him. He's worried they'll go to Nineveh. He'll go to Nineveh and they will repent. And now he'll have to make friends with them and be at peace with them. He has an inner storm, an inner conditioning to hate certain people. And here's the deal. What happens when the mariners, the sailors are facing the outer storms and Jonah's facing the inner storms? They both go to the same place. They go to religion, but it's a general religion. It's not a relational religion. See what they say, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole, remember that came out of, or guess what? There's no such thing as an atheist in a hurricane at sea. I don't care what they tell you. You know, there's almost this involuntary reflex 
when we're up against a storm and we realize we're not in control, that we'll, we'll cry out to God. Right? Mark Twain, at the end of his life, and Mark Twain was a cynic. He didn't like Christians. He didn't want to be religious. But he recounted toward the end of his life, his, a relative was dying. I can't remember if it was his wife or his daughter. And they were very, very sick. And he wrote this in his distress. He said, I prayed. I prayed like a coward. I prayed like a dog. He said he was distressed about this because he had all these doubts and reservations. But in a storm, that involuntary reflex comes out. These sailors are worshiping everything. They're worshiping all their gods. They're crying out to every one of God. And then, in fact, they finally go down to Jonah and say, well, look, do you have a God? Can you pray? Because ours aren't working, right? This is a turning to religion in general. These are people that, that come to church or, or go to prayer in the midst of a storm. And it's really not about finding God. It's about bargaining and negotiating with some ultimate being who might be able to save me from drowning. We see this all the time. When 911 happened in our country, we'll celebrate, you know, a 20th remembrance of that uh, as we relaunch our South Euclid location, uh, you know, later in, at the end of summer and fall, beginning of fall. But when 911 happened, guess what happened? Church attendance throughout America went through the roof. It was the only time that church attendance grew in America since the 60s. And it lasted for three months. And I'm kind of worried in the midst of our recent storm, COVID-19, we saw people running to church. Do you know Easter 2020, there were more people online across the world going into Easter worship than there had ever been physically in churches in the last 50 years. And by Easter of 2021, as things were getting a little better, the attendance cut by almost half. See, we have these natural impulses to run to God when there's outer storms, but they don't seem to last. And they also don't seem to do us a heck of a lot of good or we'd hang in there with it. And what about the inner storms? What about the storm that Jonah's dealing with inside? Hatred toward others, right? Um, not wanting to be with others. What does he do to quell his inner storm? He does the same thing that the, the pagan sailors do. He gets more religious, but it's just religious in a general sense. It's knowing about God, but it's not knowing God. See, when we do things like that with the inner storms, we just bring God in to bless um, our own hatred, God to come in and bless our own prejudice. This is, it's a, it's a very, very dangerous thing, right? That we ask God to endorse our agendas or our particular nationality or our, you know, political uh, aspirations. Anytime we do that, it can become very, very dangerous. Do you know the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, a horrible domestic terrorist group in our own country? Do you know that they lead their meetings out of the King James Bible and that they baptize infants in the name of Jesus Christ into the Klan? See, we just bring God into whatever our own hatred and idolatry is and get God to bless it because the endorsement of God is a very powerful and a very, very dangerous thing. In fact, in the book of Amos, we were reminded that the Israel Jonah, the Israel began to do this. They said, hey, we've been chosen by God, which means everybody else is not. And what did God choose them for? Just to be a light to the nations, just to lift up who God really was. It wasn't because they were better than anybody, but they began to get very haughty and proud. They who had once been slaves began to take slaves themselves because we're the chosen people. We're always right. And they began to discriminate and hate the world around them just like Jonah. And look what God says to them in the book of Amos. God shows up and says these words. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites? Who are the Cushites? People who lived in the religion, in the region of the Nile. They were Egyptians. They were the people God delivered. He said, you're not the same to me as those Egyptians. Did I not bring you up from Egypt? But also the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Arameans from Kerr? 
the Philistines and the Arameans were Israel's enemies, people they hated. And God said, aren't you just like them to me? He said, God says, for I will give the command and I will shake the people of Israel. Watch this. Among all the nations, as grain is shaken in a sieve and not a pebble will reach the ground. All of those who say disaster will not overtake or meet us. Why? Because we're the chosen people of God. See, we tend to use general religion to, cut, to address our outer fear and our inner fear. But here's the thing I want to say to you. Neither one of those work. Because people who rely on earthly gods, on self-made gods, are absolutely defenseless against fear. Here, let me, let me illustrate this. These pagan sailors who are calling on their gods, polytheism in that day and age and other days, um, it, there was no belief in a monotheistic God of a God overall, one creating God. So what happened is you would take fertility or the weather or your nation or your city and you would make a God and you'd make little, you know, idols to those gods. You've seen those in some movies like Gladiator or whatever. And you carried those gods around with you, right? When you went on a ship, they went with you. But the problem with these self-created gods is when the storm comes, they can't help you. When fear comes, they can't help you. Why? Because they're going to go down in the ship with you. They're going to sink with you. That's why Jesus said, do not store up your treasures on earth. Don't store it up where storms can come in and wipe them out. But, but you know, store up your treasure in heaven. Um, for where your treasure is there, your heart is also. Now, preachers through the years have preached about that. Like it's all about money, laying up your treasure. It's laying up the most important things in your life. And when we lay those up where rust cannot and uh, thieves cannot steal, rust cannot decay and storms cannot blow over. Now we have a God who may be able to help us with the outer storms that create fear and the inner turmoil that creates fear. OK, so it's not enough to apply general religion that actually can make it worse. I read a story uh, Pastor Sher Terry shared with me of, a, of an older child who was adopted by a family, uh, a Christian family, after living in an unthinkably horrible orphanage overseas where there were lots of abuse. She was brought to here to America with this family. She was shown her room. The mother very lovingly said, this is your room. And just in a nice way said, now you have to keep it clean. And the mother was amazed the next morning when she got up, um, very early, 5.30 or 6 a.m., that this young girl had been up all night cleaning that room, disinfecting it, and she was sitting on a bed that the military would be proud of, neat and put together, sitting Indian style. And as the, the new mother walked in, her heart was racing, and she said, I cleaned my room. Is it clean enough? Uh, can I stay? Do you still love me today? And the mother's heart was broken, and I, my heart was broken because too many of us that's how we think we have to earn the affection of God. And that religion will only make it worse because you'll just come to church and every sermon will tell you, well, I'm not giving enough, I'm not serving enough, I'm not doing this. But when we have a relational, a relational, um, in a personal relationship with God, things can change. And that's why the Bible tells us there's only one solution for fear. It's not giving it a dose of religion on the outside that as we've seen in 911 COVID won't last. It's not putting it on the inside and just saying, well, I guess this is the way I feel and this is kind of my own personal prejudice, but God's with me in it. It's like the church leader one time, they had a controversial vote and he was the leader of the committee and he didn't like it. He said, let the record show that 19 people voted yes, but me and God voted no. That may feel good, but it doesn't deliver you from fear. Here's the verse it does. First John chapter four, verse 18 says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. What's perfect love? We've seen it. Jesus said, no one has love greater than this, that one would give one's life for his friends. Who was he talking about? Himself personally. And I thought about, you know, perfect love casts out fear. Some translations say drives out fear. Those verbs were used with Jesus over and over again. Jesus drove out what? 
money changers in the temple who were taking advantage of the poor and exploiting people. Jesus cast out what? Demons and unclean spirits that were torturing and, and, and hurting people on the inside, outside uh, storms of oppression, inside interior uh, demonic uh, storms of, uh, of, of internal attack. And Jesus drives them out and casts them out. How? Through perfect love. Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea. What's happening to Jonah? For whatever reason, after Jonah began to confess, I'm a Hebrew, which if you read my e-note this, this week, that word meant I'm an Avery, which meant I'm one who crossed over. They refer to Abraham as an Avery. He was the very first one, the one that crossed over from the other side of the river. Jonah said, I ought to have known better. I'm one that God always calls to cross over whatever those divisions might be. Cross over my own personal fear of the Ninevites. Cross over out of my, my past failures, right? Or, or, or my concerns. Just like Jesus crossed over from heaven to earth, Jonah now is saying, yeah, I'm a Hebrew. I'm one that crosses over because I know the God of heaven, the God of the dry land, and the God of the sea. And he does something for the first time, very selfless. Up to that point, Jonah is extremely selfish. But he says, look, to these foreigners, to these non-religious people, to these people that he'd rather have nothing to do with, he'd rather stay down in his little hold in the boat. He says, what's happening to you is because of my unfaithfulness. I'm the problem. I don't want you to suffer. And in this act of selflessness, um, Jonah is coming awake to God. He's going back into his relationship with God, the one who has pursued him, right? Who 39 verses has knocked on that door of his heart. And I was just so intrigued that when Jonah says that to the sailors, they still don't throw him over. They rowed ashore. Do you ever notice acts of selflessness seem to create other attitudes of selflessness? except upon, among people who are so selfish that it always has to be about them. And when these sailors actually do throw Jonah over, that's when it says the men feared the Lord even more, um, exceedingly more. What's going on here? Because the storm had stopped. They're not afraid of the storm anymore. I mean, they had been. This is a different kind of fear. Their fear before is don't kill us, don't kill us, don't kill us. Now the storm's over. Why are they afraid? That word afraid there, that fear is often used in utterly amazed. It wasn't just, oh, wow, the storm disappeared. Oh, you know, but I'm amazed that this wrath of God, we, they knew something, God is angry, it's coming at us. That one selfless act could appease that anger and could create uh, forgiveness and create grace and love. And they were amazed. That's the solution to fear, perfect love of Jesus to Christ who threw himself overboard. And God showed us that God was one who forgives. God is one who redeems. God is one who's given us grace. We don't have to hate other people anymore, so worried that we don't measure up because that's what that's all about, right? We don't have to worry about the outer storms, buildings collapse, disease coming, because Jesus overcame the only storm that can finally kill us. And, and because of that, because of that selfless love, we can overcome our fear. Psalm 30 says it this way in the old King James. There's forgiveness with you, O Lord, that you might be feared. This kind of fear, which means revered with awe and wonder. Listen to John's whole passage when he gives us a solution. He says it this way. This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. We may have this supernatural boldness when facing the storms because as he is, so we are in the world. Oh my gosh, as God is that we might be in the world. 
Then the verse, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out all fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Did I make my bed well enough? Did I say the right prayers? Am I hanging out with the right people? Did I vote with the right party? All of that panicking is just the earthly gods going down with you in the ship. But the fear that has to do with punishment is a fear, John says, that's not re reach perfection in love. We love, not because we're perfect. We love because God loved us first. Matthew 12, Jesus says, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, I will go into the earth for three days and three nights and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. When we understand that and we understand the fear that is created, the awe and the wonder of seeing this unfathomable, unconditional love of God in Jesus Christ. Maybe we might understand better what Jesus meant. It almost sounds like he's scolding us. But when he says in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body. What is he saying? Don't be afraid of the, of the rust and the thieves in the earthly gods, but fear only, have awe and reverence only for the God that Jonah confessed, finally, of heaven, of dry land, and of sea. When we do that, maybe we hold fast to that perfect love of Jesus Christ, who threw himself oh, into the storm, the only storm, as I said, that can finally take us down. Maybe we might learn to sing in the this, in this, uh, words of John Newton. You know John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace? If you know his story, he began to first consider God when he was in a storm at sea. He cried out to God, if you save me, I'll get baptized. Well, guess what? He survived and got baptized. But he didn't quit doing what he was doing, which was selling slaves, until he went further with God. And only then, when he had a personal relationship, did he write that great hymn, Amazing Grace. And at that point, he relinquished everything to do with the slave trade and gave himself to service in God. And later on, he wrote another little hymn, a little poem that's not very well known, but I want to close with this because I don't think I can say it any better than he did. He said this way, his love in times past forbids me to think he'll leave me at last in troubles to sink. By prayer, let me wrestle. Then he will perform with Christ in this vessel. I smile at the storm. That's a solution for fear. Take in that perfect love. Take Jesus Christ into your vessel. And the, when the outer storms come or the inner storms, they're the ones that can really corrupt the world, Hebrews says. We can find uh, a faith to alleviate our fears. That's my prayer for us in today's day and age. So we'll tune back in with Jonah next week. My prayer for me and for all of us uh, as we go into this week and beyond that we would allow the, the awe and the wonder of God and what Jesus has done for us and bring us salvation would overcome our fear of whatever our image was of God before if we've thought of God as punitive or out to get us but to allow the real image of God as one who is certainly just but is also full of grace. So allow that grace to wash over you, even to swallow you and to enfold you so that we might live out of that and experience the awe and the wonder and the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.